Hey folks, this is Dr. Emily Sherning with American Resiliency. It's time for another Earth Systems Update. And as usual, the big story is in the ocean. Check out this chunky, chunky ocean. So this figure is from the Copernicus update for September. I saved the August update image as well. Let's look back to that right here. So going from August to September, you can see that the patterns in place have been there for a while. These differences in ocean temperatures have been chunky for some time. These very large areas where we're seeing water colder than normal or warmer than normal, these signs of perhaps poor mixing in the world's ocean, they have been forming up for a while and do appear to be continuing to intensify these thermal gradients. And when I look at these observed changes to Earth systems, I could certainly freak out about AMOC. You all can see quite clearly in this figure, the temperature anomalies along the Gulf Stream are striking and stacked. But I don't think we're getting the full picture if we focus on AMOC. Many of us have been watching standing temperature anomalies off the coast of Japan for the last two years, where we have seen over the last about four months a real dramatic shift towards this major Pacific thermocline. Just looking at these pictures together for a minute, on the Discord, a community member asked, why are there sort of these big solid areas that are warmer or cooler than normal in the north and this sort of extreme chunkiness, like a blenderized chunkiness in the south? It's a good question. Why are there all these intense blobs of poorly mixed, quite cool and quite warm water in the Southern Ocean. When I look for evidence to answer that question, the first place my mind goes to is Antarctica, where as you can see here, also from the September Copernicus Climate Bulletin, there's a real concentration of surface heat anomaly over Antarctica right now. Look, it's lit up red. If we look at Zach's wonderful page, we can also see that there are weird things going on with Antarctic ice, where we're really at a pretty dramatic low. These major changes, you can see sort of by the choppiness of the curve there from Zach's page, these changes of heat are coming in pulses, like heat waves, right? Coming in pulses where it'll be really hot for a short period of time, go a little bit back to normal. So we're getting melt water, cold water, fresh water pouring off of the Antarctic ice sheets in pulses. Around Antarctica, there's a powerful ocean current. Anyone who has done much learning about the Southern Pole, you know it's hard to get a boat down there because of the powerful currents. That current goes in a circle. It's called the Antarctic Circumpolar Current. If you ever touch into myth regarding Ouroboros, the serpent swallowing its tail, that's it. At the bottom of the world, this current, the Antarctic Circumpolar Current, the ACC. And we see today Ouroboros is writhing. The ACC, this powerful circular current, is getting hit by these fire hoses of fresh water from Antarctica, and it kind of blows them off like a pinwheel. I think that's the clearest explanation for the appearance of these anomalies in the Southern Oceans. Abnormal mixing, kind of like if you hit pulse on a blender for just a little bit. And in the north, we see abnormal mixing more like these waters are just not getting mixed normally. There's like a slow, slow mix. It's worth noting we're looking at this ocean stuff in sort of a chunkiness picture. Not what is the average, but how big are we leaning on either side of the average. And this overall ocean heat transfer anomaly picture includes several notable marine heat waves, including off our Pacific coast and in the Mediterranean. This has been a bad few months in taking in ocean news because things are really changing very rapidly. I want to point out that we are now over the threshold for critical biological impacts of ocean acidification. That you can read more about that in this article by The Guardian. Big thanks to The Guardian for their timeless quality climate reporting. Folks, I hope you're getting the core message from this Earth Systems update. The oceans are experiencing very big changes now. These changes are currently disrupting and are going to continue to radically disrupt major food webs in the world's oceans. This isn't a next generation problem. We're going to see these impacts unfold in the next few years. I would predict that we're going to be seeing very large changes in the populations of many species next year. 
which it's worth noting, this is happening now. We're seeing the population crash of African penguins in Namibia. And the response on the ground to this is actually very strong. People are trying to do what they can to stabilize these populations, to stabilize their food systems. There are many ocean species that are suffering now because of the impact to their food systems, and they're experiencing rapid population crash in part due to starvation. They can't find the food they need. And that's because the ocean is changing. It's not just because of direct human impacts. This is a big problem. This is a problem beyond our control. And here's how serious the changes are. The great upwelling, the cold upwelling in the Pacific off the coast of Panama has failed. That's a key nutrient cycling phenomena, and it did not occur this year for the first time since record keeping began. There's also been public recognition of the reef tip this uh, week. You can see it in nature here. This may seem like a late announcement to those who watch reefs, who have been watching warm water reef systems bleach over the last decade. You know, as we're looking at these news stories, I want you to be thinking about generation and generational impacts and not just to humans. Coral reefs aren't just pretty places, they're nurseries. This year, the time we're in now is the last generation time point for many marine species. May the efforts to create refugia succeed. There is an old teaching about foraging, about eating from the land, brought through by Robin Wall Kimmerer. She teaches not to take the first and not to take the last. This is not the time to take from the ocean. Those who rely on rich coastal life, if you want to keep doing that, you're going to need to be working the heck out of this problem. A big piece of keeping coastal areas alive will be healthy marshlands. In many coastal areas, sea level rise will overwhelm today's low-lying marshes, which are often critical areas for both ecosystem services, like cleaning the air, cleaning the water, and habitat for living things. Areas where marshes could be cultivated should be cleaned of industrial waste and kept reserved from development by any coastal community that has an interest in long-term water quality. I live in the heart of North America, far from the ocean. To me, that's felt like a good place to be because the ocean has had good reason for quite some time now to be really upset with us all. In previous mass extinction events that involved great death in the ocean, which we are seeing unfold again today, extinction rates were much lower for animals and plants that lived on land, particularly as we look towards the centers of continents. The differences are striking. We can be talking about 90% dead in the ocean two-thirds alive on land. Okay, we touched a little bit on surface air temps when we were talking about the surface air temps over Antarctica. Let's talk a little bit about how global surface temperatures have been changing in the past few months. Anyone who's been following here for a while remembers that things got weird in 23. We started seeing indicators of tipping point behavior in Earth systems in late spring of 23. The past few months, our global average temps dipped below 1.5 C for the first time in years. But we are beginning to head back up again. The 12-month average right now is still over 1.5 C. Even with a weak La Nina winter, I think it's likely we will see the global average climb back over 1.5 C in these months to come in northern hemisphere winter because we see continuing similarity between 23, 24, and 25. 23 and 24 were both marked by particularly intense January jumps in global air surface temperatures. The tipping point is what matters. The tipping point I think worth watching is heat transport in the oceans, which we are seeing unfold. Right now, we're seeing global, global surface air temperatures than we have in the past couple of years. We're seeing lower sea surface temperatures than we have in the past couple of years. If I was focusing on simple averages rather than chunkiness, we would be able to tell a different story, but I don't think it would be an accurate story. I am not especially interested in the fact that we are closer to a 12-month average below 1.5. Right now, the 12-point average is 1.51C. With the tipping point kicked off, I think we need to acknowledge that we're living in a very different world and these averages are going to give us more limited information. 
For example, you know, there's a lot of money going into geoengineering around the Earth's albedo or and around forcing precipitation. People are going to keep pushing on these projects because they're already funded. But these solutions don't take into account the big system changes we're currently experiencing. Many people in the Northern Hemisphere especially are not going to appreciate the way geoengineering effects are likely to stack with these tipping point impacts because we anticipate Northern Hemisphere cooling that is expected to be pretty next level in parts of Northern Europe related to this phase change in ocean heat transport. Going back to Zach to look at Arctic sea ice, we may be seeing the beginnings of that northern hemisphere cooling trend with this push against trend you can see here in Arctic ice. Arctic ice behaving a little lumpily, but looking better than it has in years if we just look at the average. You can see here it's dipped the 2010 trend line. These big changes in the oceans, we're going to see higher end sea level rise driven by that Antarctic melting. And that is going to drive more earthquakes. Water is heavy. If we see sea level rise, that means there's more water there and it's going to push on the tectonic plates. There's been a lot of action on the whole earthquake front lately. These big changes in the oceans, we're gonna see change to the winds as well. Here at my place, we've been experiencing unusual winds, unusual winds from the east. There are many observed substantial wind changes as we head into the fall of 25. We saw the first potential shift of the monsoon. You can see an article here providing evidence. This is a well-observed unusual moisture pattern changing a critical lifeway element for Southeast Asia. These changes, major changes that are unfurling, they're not going to go back in the bag, even if we make global changes in energy use really fast. It would be good if we can do anything to dull the impact, but we're going to hit the wall and we're looking at a rough ride to get there. We're going to experience a time of profound change. Many of the structures we've relied upon, many of the institutions we've relied on, they're now brittle. I think many of them will not be able to acknowledge changes of this magnitude or respond to change. This is why it matters we should respond to change on the ground. On the channel here, you can learn about your risk spread on the ground where you are, and you can start building resilience in your home and your community. And if you go to the channel page and click more, I would appreciate if you would consider subscribing to our mailing list. I won't be in touch with you too often. I send out a quarterly newsletter so that you can catch up on anything you may have missed. And this lets us get in touch with you if anything really major develops or if we need help. In a time where we expect more weather-related disasters, I do always try to stress that folks like me who live in temperate climates, we're often behind the ball on water storage. That's an area where many of us who are otherwise fairly resilient to disaster need to improve is water storage. There are many scenarios where having a few days water in the house can make an awful situation into a tolerable situation. And if you haven't taken care of water for your household yet, now is a good time. The changes that are unfolding now are beyond our power to stop. We are going to experience profound changes in our lifetimes. I've been following this ocean story for years now. The ocean story is the big story. Ocean's mad, everyone. You know, if you're on the coast, you want to be thinking about land-based food systems because the great life in the ocean is going to be suffering at this time more than in land. If these earth system trends kind of unfold like it looks they're going to, we'll be about to see over baseline right around the time the death in the ocean has become absolutely undeniable. As a global civilization, I'd be surprised if we end up producing as many emissions as we've been projected to in the second half of this calamitous century. The overall conditions we're likely to experience, the great storms, the intense freezes and heat waves, are likely to continue to intensify here on land for many decades. But here's hard truth for those of you listening to the end. This tipping point is probably better for the future of life. This may result in a less serious mass extinction event than if we had made it to 2100 without hitting this tipping point. This timeline that we are on 
has a larger window of survival for the terrestrial biosphere. If we want to make the most of that window and get what we can through, it's time for a new story. Not a story based on where we came from, where we might return. Not a story about stopping change. Not a story about going back. We need a story based on where we might go and what are we going to make within this frame. Because whatever we're going to build, it's not coming from the top. The way we're going to experience this future is going to be very local. And anyone who wants to see what they can save, this is the time to be well at work on creating the local systems we need. People talk about bioregional thinking, and there's a lot of value in that, but we need to take it to the next level. We need bioregional thinking with change embraced, a move away from standing pattern, away from a fixed and ideal vision of the past, a move towards dynamic emergence. Think about what it would mean to live this way. Mentally and emotionally taxing, yes? What we need in these times of change is resilience inside and out to help us move through fear. What I have created in my life thus far that has been good, it was not created in a space free from suffering. Good things can be created under very difficult conditions. To learn, to play, to continue to create good things. These are actions that are extremely protective, actually, for people experiencing trauma. When we think about how to help people who are experiencing trauma, disaster, suffering, I think we often work towards providing comfort. We look towards providing security. No one is like, hey, what if we take a foreign language class together? But that sort of active learning is what helps people make it through. It's what protects them from very serious psychological damage. Engaging in active language acquisition, just as one researched example, is an intensely powerful protective factor for mental health under long-term catastrophic stress conditions. You got to keep things swirling around in your brain. You got to keep it fresh in there so the pain doesn't freeze in your mind. If that happens, that can be hard to get it out. You can be stuck. You got to keep moving. Because this must be a time of powerful imagining and powerful action. You got to stay loose. Let yourself feel it. Because there's great work to do. Thank you for getting ready with me as we respond to these times of change. Let's brace up. Thanks again for spending some time learning with me today. This is heavy information to take in. I think it's worth it to take it in so that we can make informed decisions about our lives in this time of change. And I want to say a big thank you to the AR community, our donors, our volunteers, everyone spreading the word online, and everyone doing the work on the ground. You all make this work possible. Thank you so much. And I'll look forward to talking with you all again soon.